from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the Southern Oregon Television Award for Program of the Year and the Award for Best Educational Program. I'm the host and producer, John Letts. Ramping Up Your English is an educational support program for intermediate English learners. It's a program for people from all language backgrounds. Ramping Up Your English is also for people of all ages. If you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and want to reach higher levels of proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is animals. This is segment one of episode 65. Most people are fascinated by the ocean. Perhaps it's the fact that our oceans are the cradle of life on our planet. Or maybe it's the way the ocean engages so many of our senses. It's such a different place than places where most people live. Besides engaging our imagination, the edge of the ocean is where many people find deep rest and healing. Sometimes the ocean can seem devoid of life, but we know better than that. What forms of life live under those waves? It's said that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about our own oceans. From the coast of Oregon, we enjoy sweeping views of our Pacific Ocean. Well, our great views often include ocean animals like seals and sea lions. In our last episode, we learned about seals and sea lions. Then we listed adaptations of harbor seals, followed by a list of how those adaptations gave harbor seals an advantage in their marine environment. We used the connecting words and phrases that put these facts together in a way that shows cause and effect relationship between the facts. In this episode, we'll take a closer look at those connecting words and we'll learn some more about this whole concept of adaptations. We'll also use, as we'll also learn, about other marine mammals. Now, in our last segment, we listed five physical adaptations that harbor seals have. Then we listed the advantages that are gained by having these adaptations. We showed how to connect those facts in a way that shows a cause-effect relationship. Let's quickly review how we did that. Notice the words in large print. Those are the connecting words that show that you're uh, drawing a cause-effect relationship between the facts. Harbor seals have powerful hind flippers, which allows them to swim fast so they can catch prey and escape predators. Now we work with the second adaptation we identified. The small head allows smooth movement through the water. The eyes are large, permitting good vision in low light conditions. Now for that blubber. An insulating layer of blubber beneath the skin keeps the seal warm in cold wet water. And now those sensitive ears. I use the verb helping to avoid overusing the word allow. I also use the verb facilitates as the connecting word to the effect. Then I added more detail. Mother seals produce milk that's very high in fat content, facilitating rapid growth, especially the growth of blubber that conserves the pup's body heat in cold environments. Now, here's a list that has those connecting words. The first two on the list are the most common for the function of linking cause and effect when it comes to an animal's adaptations. The word allow or allows can be used in several ways with other words. The other common connector is the phrase, so they can. Now you can also use the phrase, in order to. The other connecting words can be a great help when listing several adaptations. You never want to overuse a word or phrase. The words permitting and facilitating can also be used, as well as the phrase helping them 
or helping it, depending on whether you use the singular or plural form. These connecting words can be found on my website. Go to letscreate.org and navigate to the episode 65 page. That's where you'll find the list. You can also use these connecting words to illustrate the cause-effect relationship in the physical adaptation section of your report on the animal of your choice. Now these key words and phrases are critical to communicating a cause-effect relationship. What could be more central to science? Science can be seen as exploring and testing the relationship between cause and effect. Now you may think of science as being an academic matter or a professional concern. Well, it is both of those. But science, the tested and true relationship between cause and effect, is critical to our role as citizens of our community, nation, and world. There are a lot of so-called facts being communicated through social media, misinformation and falsehoods designed to trick us into supporting those who are working against our interest and the health of our communities. There are some very dark agendas being carried out, and they depend on sowing confusion in the minds of people. Now, this situation has made it impossible for us to have a national discourse on issues that matter. From Russian hackers to TV networks masquerading as news outlets, many people in the United States, including political leaders, are embracing beliefs that have no relationship to reality. The antidote to this dangerous situation is a skeptical approach. Is there a true cause-effect relationship between the pieces of information we're given? It's like my old biology professor insisted we ask the question, where's the proof for that? Now, science can often isolate a cause-effect dynamic even when multiple causes and effects are in play. When we're finished with this science unit on animals, we'll tackle a social studies unit. Multiple causation and effects are common when looking at human affairs. Indeed, simplistic explanations are always suspect. A social studies unit will be coming up soon, but meanwhile, we're continuing with our study of animals. This episode has us exploring physical adaptations. It's a fair question to ask why these are called adaptations instead of just physical features. The concept of adaptations recognizes very slow changes that occur to living organisms over time. When conditions were different on Earth, ancestors of today's seals may not have had that layer of fat that today's animals need for colder water. Each generation has some amount of variability, just as we can see with people. So as the water got colder, those seal ancestors with a little extra fat survived, whereas the others in their population with less fat didn't. So those with that extra fat survive long enough to reproduce, bringing more fat seals into the population. As environmental pressures increased, those with the most fat survived to pass on their genes, and now all seals have the required amount of blubber to live in their cold water environments. Thus, the layer of blubber is an adaptation to a changing environment. If you followed that explanation, done without any visual clues, then your English listening proficiency is getting strong. If you're left wondering what in the world I was talking about, keep watching Ramping Up Your English. Your listening skills will continue to grow and you'll reach higher levels of English proficiency. This ends segment one of episode 65. Let's start segment two with a look at sea lions. While sea lions have many adaptations in common with seals, they have some that seals don't. They move better on land due to their flippers that can change position, allowing them to use them as feet. Now, sea lions also have external ear flaps. They often float together in groups called rafts. Let's look at another marine animal that has a very different set of adaptations. Here's a short video about sea otters. Sea otters are marine mammals that have adaptations of very high quality, physical adaptations that turned out to be their greatest danger, leading them almost to extinction.
Sea otters are not shy. This one unconcerned about a raft of seals it's swimming among. Sea otters are often seen floating on their backs, their hands folded as if praying. More often these hands are busy, feeding themselves or grooming their fur. Sea otters have great mobility under the water. They move swiftly like powerful living torpedoes in the water. Their muscular tails propel them through the cold water where they live. So what are otters doing underwater? Well, mostly they're looking for food. And the food they seek is not the fish that swim among them. What sea otters really want to find are shellfish, and one of those is the sea urchin. Their taste for shellfish and their ability to eat them make them important in maintaining a balance in their environment. When sea otters were absent from coastal California, sea urchin numbers rose sharply, and the urchins ate so much of the kelp forest that they damaged the whole system. When sea otters returned, they ate enough urchins to bring the system back into balance. The efforts to sustain sea otters include the work by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. While their sea otter display dazzles visitors, their conservation work supports their populations. Visitors can see sea otters grooming their fur. Without a thick layer of blubber, sea otters are kept warm by their thick coats of fur. How thick? A million hairs per square inch. It's that fur that almost drove them to extinction. Otter pelts were very valuable in the fur trade, making them the victims of fur trappers. Fortunately, laws and agreements between countries have saved the sea otter. Along with endless grooming of their fur, sea otters often gather a rock with the shellfish they collect. They use the rock to crack open the shell allowing them to eat the soft inside of the shellfish. Sea otters are distinct from river otters. Their thick fur and their use of tools are adaptations that are exclusive to sea otters. They do share some features though. They are both very strong swimmers and they both apparently like to have fun. They're playful. Sea otters are another marine mammal with adaptations that allow them to thrive in our oceans. You're watching Ramping Up Your English. I'm your host, John Letts. This is episode 65, our second part about learning the physical adaptations. Now, we're looking at the ocean to explore the adaptation of marine mammals. A song by a group called America contained the lyrics, the ocean is a desert with its life underground and the perfect the skies above. Well, the ocean can certainly have the beauty of the desert, but the life under the surface of the water can be intense. A coral reef is normally a place teeming with life. The complexity of the food web can often be seen here. Coral reefs are cradles for many ocean species, all of them adapted to this special ecosystem. Like the sea otter, these adaptations can equip ocean animals to live and thrive in their environment. Those same adaptations can also pose a danger to them. The striking colors of the coral attract people, some of them wanting to take a piece of it home. Now that not only damages the coral directly, it sometimes results in diseases that devastates the entire colony. We'll explore more of the ocean environment and what it tells us about animal adaptations. Meanwhile, let's look at some other animals and their physical adaptations. Let's start with this duck. This card shows a duck with two body parts labeled, its beak and its feathers. So how do these features help it survive in its environment? Well, the flat, wide beak allows it to trap food under the water. Those feathers are waxy. The dove can dip under the surface of the water without getting its skin wet or cold. Those feathers on its wings also help the duck migrate long distances, something many ducks do in the winter. Now we consider the elephant. We showed a video in an earlier episode about elephants. 
do you remember some of the elephant's adaptations? That long trunk is a multi-purpose adaptation that helps the elephant reach and grab food, drink water, throw water on its body to cool off, and facilitates bonding with other elements, or elephants, I mean, in its family group. The big ears also provide an important function. The large ears function as radiators, allowing them to cool their body temperatures. The large ears also make the elephant look more dangerous to potential predators. Now here's an animal we haven't said much about. The wide foot and hump are identified in this picture. Now how are these adaptations able to help camels survive in their desert habitats? You know, as a child, I used to believe that the hump was a tank holding water. I later found that wasn't the case. But the hump is a mass of fat that increases the amount of water a camel's body can contain. I'm sure you can make the connection between retaining water and living in a dry climate. The wide feet allow the camel to walk over loose, sandy terrain, distributing its weight so it doesn't sink down into the sand. This picture clearly illustrates the advantage of having a long neck. The giraffe can reach vegetation that other animals can't. It also enables them to see trouble coming from far away. As for the patterned fur, how do you think this helps a giraffe? I suspect it helps them blend into their environment, making them hard to see by predators. We learned about these adaptations in an earlier episode not long ago. Those claws are very sharp. They can allow this raptor to grab and hold on to prey. The beak is also sharp. Now They need that to tear their food into bite-sized pieces since they have to swallow food without chewing it. Now what about these adaptations of the polar bear? A look at its surroundings tells us that it needs that thick fur to retain its body heat in the extreme cold environment in which it lives. The color of the fur is also an adaptation, making the polar bear blend in with its snowy and icy surroundings. While adult polar bears have little to fear from predators, they don't want to be too obvious to their prey. Now, the sharp claws help them do something that would be extremely difficult without them. It enables them to grab and hold seals when they come up through the air to breathe. And that's the main food source for polar bears. Let's consider the turtle. The turtle shell makes it a really cool animal, but that shell has more important functions. The hard shell protects turtles from many predators. Now, since turtles live in streams and ponds, they need those webbed feet to swim without using up too much energy. It's an important adaptation. Now, one of my favorite animals is the cheetah. It looks a bit lanky with those long legs, but that's what enables them to run fast when pursuing prey. Those sharp teeth allow them to kill the prey once they've pounced on it. The sharp teeth also permit them to eat the prey they kill. Finally, there's the fish. Well, all fish have gills. It's one thing that makes them a fish. Gills enable fish to get oxygen from the water. Their fins help them swim, and some fins are sharp enough to prevent being killed by some predators. I got these cards as part of a reading series. We'll look at some resources you can use to find the physical adaptation of your subject when we return. This ends segment two of episode 65. Organization that's doing big time restoration of forests and stream banks. Hello, I'm John Letts, producer of Adventures in Education. You're watching Ramping Up Your English, a source of help for intermediate English learners who want to improve their English skills. Now, if that's you, you're in the right place. We take a content-based approach to elevating English proficiency. Our current unit is Animals. This is segment three of episode 65. In the past two episodes, we've explored the physical adaptations of animals. The source I used for the examples included the wildlife cards we use for other sections of the animal reports. If you have access to these cards, 
you'll find they have most information you need to research and report on your animal of your choice. Now, if you don't have access to them, here are some other good sources. I recommend an encyclopedia. Now, before you complain that these are such old school, you're likely to find information about your animal's physical adaptations. There's also Wikipedia. This source has improved considerably over time, and when a fact needs a source, it's pointed out by the words, citation needed. Wikipedia is a good starting point for your research. A book about the animal you're researching is likely to have a great deal of information needed for your report. Some sources may organize this information under the heading of adaptations, but it's also likely to be found under anatomy or other sections of the article. Just keep in mind while reading that adaptations are the physical traits of an animal that give it an advantage to surviving the conditions of its environment. Now, I realize that for many viewers, this project may be demanding. Like children from a different language background in school, you're learning science and learning a new language at the same time. It's important to allow yourself mistakes while taking these risks. Watch this video where you'll meet someone who has learned four languages, but that's not to say they always came out smoothly. What level of English would you need to host a TV show? Well, Dr. Krishna Gokhani produces and hosts two TV shows on RVTV. English is his fourth language, yet that's the language he uses for programs about health and meditation. In an earlier interview, Dr. Gokhani shared how he felt ashamed of his low English proficiency when he had to speak English in a medical setting. Like many English learners, he experienced negative reactions at times from native English speakers. But that didn't stop him from taking the risks of using a new language. Have you ever had anyone, you know, give you, you know, interact negatively with you because of your limitation in the language? That I can tell you when I started working as a doctor, uh, my first job in Mumbai, that time it was called Bombay, and the uh, hospital's name was St. George Hospital, and all nurses speak fluent English. And as a doctor, I started there, but I could not speak one sentence perfectly. Mm -hmm. Though I knew I can write essays of 10 pages, but speak spoken language I didn't have. I felt so ashamed that how can I be a doctor in front of nurses? They laugh, you know, when you cannot utter or you cannot reply in English one full sentence. That was the first time. Despite the embarrassment of making mistakes in English, he not only persisted in developing his skills as a doctor, he improved his English and learned other languages as his medical practice demanded. Everybody has to face this situation, but overcome with confidence and just perseverance that you have to. I tell you two more languages I had to learn when I went to practice in Africa, in Kenya. There, it, there was a Swahili, the Swahili. Oh. I didn't know anything, but most of my patient, I can say 98% of the patient, will speak in Swahili and then my secretary will interpret in English. I uh, speak in English, he will interpret in Swahili to the person. That's why I had to learn this African language. Then time came that tourists mostly came from Germany and uh, beaches in Kenya, in Mombasa, especially where I practice, so beautiful. So they started coming in bulk, you know, special charter flights and all. And as patient, I didn't know German. I had to do evening classes for six months. I at least started speaking and understanding the German language. So, you know, language is an asset and it makes you more smart and your brain has got a different communication 
and learning area where you feel yourself so much happy you know in medical school books were in english but only thing the speaking was the problem yeah we understand we write as i told you earlier but the speaking there was a fear that i can't speak Yes. And I think that's that's where the biggest risk is I think in a language yeah. is when you're actually putting it on your tongue. Yeah. And it's not always going to come out right. You know, that that's the thing I try to encourage my listeners. Don't look for 100% accuracy. Yes. Don't look for perfection. Look for are you communicating? Are you getting your ideas across? I give you a good example when I went to England, I had a 3-year uh, old daughter. Now she didn't no a single word of english and the children uh, our doctors campus other children were speaking english so she was playing with them and she was with the gesture with our language she will reply they will speak in english and in 15 days she started speaking english <laughs> that's great not as grammatically perfect but she could understand and she could make other people and but in 15 day so that daring like a child you must have because you have got the same capacity whatever age you are you have got the same capacity only your intention and effort is needed so let's be like the little child and dive right into the language mistakes can be stepping stones to greater proficiency and who knows maybe your english will go strong enough to host a tv show i'd love to know how it's going for you you can get in touch with me send an email to letscreatepro@gmail.com visit my website letscreate.org for all the support materials for this episode just navigate to the episode 65 page you can watch and even download all episodes of ramping up your english at archive.org/details slash rogue tv use the search box by entering ramping up your english you'll also find all the episodes there ramping up your english can be seen in ashland on channel 15 of the ashland home network and in the rest of southern oregon on charter cable 182 show times are 8 a.m. on mondays and 7:30 p.m. on thursdays visit rvtv.sou.edu for free live streaming Show times will vary in different areas. Check your local public access and education stations. I want to thank my director Denise Ross and my talented and loyal crew, and I want to thank you, our viewers. All of you help make this program an award winner. Join us next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org/details/rogue-tv. Join us next time on RBTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.